Welcome back to another episode of BRF Shots and Us. So today this episode is pretty interesting simply because we came up with something really unique and we're quite proud of ourselves for it. Uh but today is the 2nd of October which is uh Gandhi Jayanti in India and tomorrow which is the 3rd of October is an equally important day for us uh it is Mean Girls Day which is uh if you've seen so if you've seen the movie uh there is a part in the film where uh, Lindsay Lohan who plays the protagonist is um she asks her crush um what day of the I mean she's barely talking to him and she, he asks her what day of the what day is it or something like that and she says it's the 3rd of october and ever since fans around the world celebrate 3rd of october as mean girls day so in light of all of these wonderful things happening this weekend our episode for today is aptly titled charkhas and chick flicks <laughs> applause because we think and we are very clever extremely about this. proud yes we really are yeah so if you're giving any feedback just remember to make it positive or else <laughs> Yes, because we are very sensitive, along with being very proud. <laughs> so, um, so just to like start off, I know everybody probably already knows this, and that you know it's common knowledge in India uh, how important the spinning wheel was to the free India movement, and mm-hmm. it was you know made this huge national symbol of uh, of a revolution really by Gandhi ji, and. Um, So let me just rewind about the spinning wheel itself and why he chose it. Um when the spinning wheel first came into existence it increased the productivity of thread making by like 10 times more than it was before. Um so there are historians that a uh, medieval historians that credit the spinning wheel with increasing the supply of rags. Hmm. Bear with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> with increasing the supply of rags which led to cheap paper. which in turn was a factor in the development of printing so its yes. effects were sort of far reaching and um it obviously during the industrial revolution it became you know like fundamental to the cotton textile industry um and it was also a precursor to the spinning jenny which was the mechanical version of the spinning wheel and um oh. yeah and so mahatma gandhi he was um Uh, he was he was known for dressing in a particular way you know he was he dressed simple he emphasized on the essential things in life rather than you know the superficial uh his philosophy is widely um, documented so if you want to let know more about that you can google it <laughs> <laughs> but um he chose the traditional uh, loin cloth as a rejection of western culture and if you had any context of what was happening in india at the time there was a massive um you know get the british out of india movement mm-hmm. <laughs> and it became also this uh, you know the loin cloth as well as the material used for it which was cotton became a symbolic identification with the poor of india and at this time what the intellectual like the literati who were silently and loudly in some cases revolting against the british what what they wanted to do was unite india so you know this had to go because india was at the time quite classist still this had to go across all the different people in the country you know because power in numbers so they just wanted to unite people under one cause and this personal choice of gandhi ji's mm. became like a powerful political gesture and um it also sort of unified them in the way they looked in the way they dressed you know it just uh, it's small things like this that actually become powerful symbols later on and so gandhi ji he claimed that spinning thread in the traditional manner also had material advantages because it would create the basis for economic independence and the possibility for survival for india's impoverished people uh, because you know it was about going from being a colonial nation to starting out on your own so it was also about coming up with sustainable ways to create this new india um mm-hmm. and so this commitment to traditional cloth making was also part of the larger swadeshi movement which meant that british goods no thank you <laughs> which <laughs> is funny because you see a resurgence of it now in the us with you know well not now but when trump was in power you saw a resurgence with him saying you know make america great again and um obviously the comparison there is completely different but it's it's interesting how people you know use identity to create this movement against something 
it's interesting yeah. it goes yeah. both ways yeah it does it truly it really does it was interesting because apparently gandhi ji was talking to charlie chaplin <laughs> oh is is this a thing did not know this um like what gandhi ji talking to people <laughs> yeah well not people but charlie <laughs> chaplin like completely uh, like one who has uh, actually both of them had personas that they had chosen so i suppose they had more in common than we think but uh, yeah. he apparently explained to charlie chaplin in 1931 that the return to spinning did not mean a rejection of all modern technology but of the exploitative and controlling economic and political system in which textile manufacture had become entangled so it was multifaceted this adoption of you know know spinning and uh, using more traditional fabrics and getting rid of british goods and not using them boycotting them with this introduction <laughs> in mind uh this is the context for an article that i was uh, i attempted to read because it was written by rabindranath tagore and if anybody's read anything by him that was essay form you know that you've got to It's concentrate long. really hard <laughs> because a sentence can go on forever <laughs> interestingly you think that everybody in the freedom movement was you know aligned and and agreed with each other because the end goal was the same but um tagore yeah. had a problem with it yeah he in fact wrote this essay uh he wrote a letter to gandhi ji you know uh, talking about what he thought was wrong with this promoting the charkha and he then wrote an essay called the cult of the charkha which uh, was basically like a criticism of hmm. this whole movement. Hmm. Yeah, it was very interesting. So some of the problems he had with it was that he talked about just spinning and the problem of repetition. He and it's a very ph- philosophical way of looking at it because it's a it, it is a matter of opinion rather than fact. Hmm. So he states that Indian society through the process of the caste system has had a leveling down of the masses of over the ages and he says uh, that every individual of every caste has his function assigned to him together with the obsession into which he has been hypnotized that since he is bound by some divine mandate accepted by his first ancestor it would be sinful for him to seek relief therefrom so this is just a complicated way of of saying that the problem of this problem of repetition cuts at the very soul of human spirit he says mm-hmm. that it's contrary to everything that fosters creativity so the minute that you know like you doing something repetitive means that your brain is switched off <laughs> and so um which i disagree with i have my yeah, most I profound do do. moments yeah. while washing dishes <laughs> so oh, wow, okay <laughs> <laughs> there i've said it it's out and out mm-hmm. in the world now <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would say something like <laughs> you know I write every day for half an hour and that's how I get my <laughs> oh no no who writes for <laughs> half an hour you <laughs> <laughs> So he also talks about the nature of labor he mm. says that repetitive manual labor routine with without innovation and fresh inputs is unlikely to positively impact the intellect so not only does it make you not creative it also makes you stay at the same level of intellect <laughs> as you were before <laughs> so if you started out not that great <laughs> according to tagore so you're going to stay it's not what i believe <laughs> um and obviously this is a simplistic way of explaining his opinions on the uh on the matter but you know we like we're a half a comedy podcast so <laughs> <laughs> um uh and the last thing is the charkha as a symbol in the first place he didn't believe that spinning would in any way contribute to the economic future of the country uh so again so he basically just like obliterated like as he called it the cult of the charkha but also mm-hmm. at the end of his essay this is this is a true mark of a man or a woman is he addresses gandhi ji reverentially in the end of his essay by proclaiming him as being a great moral personality an embodiment of shakti which is divine energy provided to the people of india by providence itself so you know this is this is a way to disagree with someone the next time you have like a school like a playground in <laughs> bully get after you just be like you suck but also <laughs> you're the soul of the school you got yeah you've got great <laughs> hair and you're a gift to everyone here <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's the story of to go so you know what i was actually thinking about in the course of my research and then kind of really ties in well with what you talked about because it does talk about how the essence of gandhi is of course he's you know he's he, it's also the ability to kind of think through a thought like you know from start to end and kind of just 
define all of these different moments that are going to happen as a result of this one particular symbol that he's chosen yeah but also like you know uh, like all the time that you know i was kind of doing my research i just kept thinking that like honestly of everything else apart great politician like all of those things but also what a fantastic marketer and designer right <laughs> and i think like it really comes out because not to trivialize it at all mm. but i do think that just you know in terms of like you know the symbol of the charkha and what it meant to kind of you know he became a great brand ambassador for what he was his selling. product basically yeah <laughs> selling in some way because he only wore khadi you know just in the way that he's kind of talked about it and propagated it and kind of inculcated it into the message of the nation khadi is still like i mean you know it's a brand i mean you know, multiple brands call themselves khadi it's still like you know i mean you still see people using it even in modern day india not just to kind of like you know talk about like obviously politicians still use it to kind of you know talk about austerity and all of that but like you know even common people wear it um, and it is used in like uh, fashion clothes in modern fashion today yeah for sure mm. um and also so in doing this you know so it's obviously got like he's he's obviously got the brain of a designer and he's obviously able to like i kind of think it through in terms of not just in terms of like this sort of symbolic use of the product but also like very deeply in the practical use of the product and what it's going to really do and mm-hmm. how it can kind of like sort of grab the imagination of a nation and and propel it towards a certain cause which i thought was kind of like amazing to just think about because i you know in all of the times obviously you know in india we grew up learning about the swadeshi movement and learning mm-hmm. about this fight for independence and gandhi ji is a huge part of it but you never think of it in in you know in this context of just like what a great marketing campaign also um mm-hmm. but also talking about gandhi ji as a as a, uh, as a designer in this i realized that so when he was as part because he obviously traveled a lot and he got arrested a lot as part of his work uh this has it of the job i guess uh, <laughs> he apparently invented a charkha or a spinning wheel he created like this foldable charkha that he could take along with him every time he got and he created this in the yarwada jail so he was like you know when i travel or when i get arrested again it will allow me to have my charkha with me because he couldn't carry the original contraption so mm. apparently gandhi uh, mahatma gandhi designed a foldable charkha during his time in uh, pune's yarwada jail and this was in the 1940s and in in 2013 it sold at an auction in the uk for at what was 110000 pounds what was it doing in the uk yeah that's what a lot of people have asked and a lot of people were like look it should just come back to india but uh, i think we like we lost that fight amongst many others like um, the kohinoor yeah we're still so sore about that <laughs> um so there was a lot of like pushback about like just being you know uh that this is a symbol of like india's uh, history and it needs to come back to india but uh, apparently uh, i don't even know who actually who won the auction and who has the charkha but it did sell for 110000 pounds in the uk and keeping in vein with the idea of mahatma gandhi being a fantastic designer uh, at the core of his entire political philosophy mm-hmm. there is a really interesting startup Well, it's not really a startup, but it's it's a single uh, Bangalore-based engineer who has invented something called the E Charkha, which is basically uh, it's the charkha as we know it, and it can be used in villages. It has a battery attached to it, and as you work the charkha, the battery charges, and it could light an LED light bulb or it could power a transistor for six to seven hours in rural India. I thought it was. Cool. Yeah, I thought it was a really interesting way of like kind of bringing the symbolism to something that you know someone in a village in India would know how to operate, but then also like kind of giving them access to basic amenities as a result of that. That's really cool. Yeah, uh, the company that has patented the invention is called Flexotron. They are a Bangladesh company, and I think they are currently in testing phase for this at this point. As far cool. As I, can tell. I just wanted to. I don't know why, but my immediate response was to whoop whoop when you said Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to visit India again. <laughs> mm, I think so. I think it's time. Because <laughs> you know, Bangalore yeah. was like my my singlehood was in Bangalore. Uh, I got married and immediately left the country. And um, one of the things that my parents were afraid of me doing or being was a spinster. This oh. is a very long-winded way <laughs> of bringing the next topic into play, which is I was thinking about this word spinster, and I I wanted to look it up in relation to this episode, and lo and behold, struck gold. So <laughs> <laughs> apparently, the word spinster itself 
well everybody knows that it refers to an unmarried woman who's older than she should be and um you know has gone past her prime and all this other offensive rubbish yes <laughs> and <laughs> one of the other obviously there are other terms associated with it but we'll talk about spinster one of the other terms was old maid <laughs> Oh yeah cuz in the 1600s apparently you know there were some women who would go into their old age at the time i'm assuming the median age was like 40s 50s so <laughs> old age was like 30 <laughs> yeah <laughs> a 30 year old old maid yeah and so it was it was sort of it was having that dual purpose of uh, not only is she old but because she's not married she must also be virginal so old maid uh yeah okay. i think people were yeah. quite uh, <laughs> quite naive at the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was going to say possibly in first surprise or maybe not i don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and then in 17th century new england there were also words like thorn back which okay. i i can't again refer to which apparently is still in use today as a pejorative word but um oh, yeah it's like thorn a back? because it's like a sea animal with that like, that's covered with thorny spines and i'm assuming it has it has a similar effect as calling someone frigid who isn't uh, you know married or older and and unaccompanied or <laughs> single jeez oh, super unnecessary just yeah that's the best word for it unnecessary let's just stop <laughs> so by the 17th century uh, this is mostly in england because obviously the records held are from this time in england um s- terms such as spinster and single women emerged first um mm. they were essentially related to women who were unmarried whose main employment or profession used to be spinning wool um because women who were married had by way of being married to a man had a source of income which is uh, jeff give me some money mm. uh but on married women could then decide if he wanted to or not yeah so great <laughs> really reliable yeah um and on married didn't have that couldn't resort to that so they had to have a profession or a job and the oh, most common dear. profession what a terrible life i know it was just disgusting <laughs> yeah, imagine <laughs> having a job yeah, it really sucks i have to agree with that though. i mean considering there were many <laughs> labor laws it would have been pretty shitty but <laughs> But yeah, the, just generally just probably better off than asking a man for money. And uh, so they that's where the term spinster developed from. Women who spin, ah. usually single, spinster, single woman. It's very simple. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> basically any woman who had a means of an income for herself yeah spinster not good yeah i would have just been like okay you can call me spinny for short <laughs> <laughs> okay then <laughs> okay so now i'm going to come to what is my absolute favorite part of this episode i have been dying to to do this uh, since i discovered this uh, some time ago uh, so coming to the chick flick part of the episode I saw this like it's a fantastic video on YouTube and we're going to like I don't know how I'm going to link it but I will put it up somewhere on Instagram or something so just keep an eye out. It's a video that talks about about the civil disobedience movement in Mean Girls. Like what? Cool. <laughs> I know. It was hugely exciting because I was like wow, it it you know honestly when we came up with this ep- the the name for this episode we were like yeah we'll see what happens it'll be fun. And then when I found like such a perfect match I like it was a song, it's a hand from above. Uh <laughs> can't make up stuff like this. <laughs> but Okay so the story of mean girls for those of you who don't know is that is Lindsay Lohan walks into a school she's been home schooled for 15 years of her life because her parents were in Africa and then she comes and she joins an American high school and she meets uh the stray of mean girls which is led by the most iconic character of all times Regina George uh who's played by Rachel McAdams and so Regina George is sort of the dictator of this high school and she kind of rules it with this iron hand and then you have Lindsay Lohan who walks in and aided by another student this girl by the name of Janice who in this story takes the role of political opposition who was once in favor of the current regime and now is out of favor and so therefore decides mm. to go against the current regime of Regina George and Janice then guides Lindsay Lohan's character in a movement of peaceful civil disobedience to remove Regina from her place as the queen of the high school peaceful <laughs> then it's kind of peaceful like no well, they're not like only in that only that it's not violent but it's not peaceful yeah <laughs> uh i'm going to make her fat and i'm going to yeah. destroy her life 
peacefully. <laughs> peacefully, yeah. I mean, no one's going to get hurt except Regina George. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, but it's really cool because there's this, like, there's this whole scene where she kind of, you know, sits Lindsay Lohan down and, like, talks to her and tells her, you know, why is she, like, why is she as powerful as she is? And she's as powerful because she has technical, what is it? So, sorry, the lines are, the three points are, high status man candy, who also happens to be Aaron Smith, who is the guy who asks Lindsay Lohan what, what day it is and therefore we celebrate tomorrow as the holiest of all days, uh, Mean Girl Days, uh, Mean Girls Day. And uh, the other resource that she has is her technically good physique, which is her hot body, because Regina George is considered extremely hot in high school and therefore sort of follows this conventional pattern of like attractiveness. And her band of ignorant loyal followers, which is the other two girls in that trio of Mean Girls. And so the movement basically aims to cut off her resources by trying to make her fat, stealing her man and taking away her followers yeah and then it's eventually pretty, like, yeah. yeah it's pretty yeah. organized organized it's destruction just, yeah. and apparently according to research uh the three pillars of a dictatorship are legitimacy co-optation and repression and if either if any of these are shook uh it's likely to lead to the to the dictatorship falling and sort of making the dictatorship unstable so actually it does have some resonance in political strategy Mm. who would have thought and therefore it really I mean like yeah Tina Fey is a writer of Mean Girls and I, like it really is a cult comedy for a yeah. reason uh, it's also like it's yeah it's just a great film guys go watch it I mean even if they're into chick flicks or not it's just um, and regardless of whether you think chick flicks is derogatory or any of that but Mean Girls is just a great film in my opinion so with that <laughs> out and out like sale <laughs> that is the end of the episode we hope you enjoyed it and let us know what you thought about um uh, Charkhas and chick flicks being put together. Yeah. And um, don't forget to follow us on Instagram. We put up really interesting facts up there. And there is some additional information from the episodes that we put up on there. We're at Belly Research Facts. Yes. And we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.